All right, guys. Uh, we are back. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to GPPD Podcast. Um, today's going to be good. So I have my host, Joe. How's it going? All right, man. It's going. Uh, it's a beautiful Friday evening. About to rain, I bet. I, I hope so. <laughs> you anyway. feel it in your bones? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you get this age. Uh, stuff starts <laughs> hurting. Um, so today, very interesting. Um, we have here Mr. Kent. I appreciate you coming in and talk to us. Honored to be here, to say the least. Um yeah, so I want to jump right in, um, if you don't mind, uh, before we get started. So a couple things. I know to all our listeners, uh, GrandPrairiePolice.org, we need detention staff. We need uh, communications. Mm-hmm. Um, get online, fill out the applications, qualified people. This is a great department, so we're looking for great people. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. So uh, if you would. Introduce yourself, uh, let the Absolutely. listeners know uh, a little bit Absolutely. about yourself, and we'll get started. Absolutely. My, my name's Kent Williams. I was been a police officer for 32 years sworn uh, in the Chicago metropolitan area. Not Chicago proper, but just outside of Chicago. Kind of your relationship with, I would say, Dallas. You okay. know, mm-hmm. uh, kind of one of the immediate surrounding uh, players in the metropolitan area. And I was 20 in the academy. Yeah. Uh, and I retired when I was 52. So I did 32 years sworn. I've been doing cons- full-time consulting for law enforcement for the last seven years. I'm 59 now. And along the way, I had some things to figure out because uh, the more and more I got indoctrinated into law enforcement culture, the more I started fitting in and not understanding the potential potential caustic ramifications of just fitting into a culture you don't understand. So the better I got at tactically, the more I realized this indoctrination actually changes who you are as a human being. And if you don't know specifically how or why it changes you, next thing you know, you might be working with a group of people who have changed significantly, fitting into a culture they don't understand. And these changes aren't always for the better. Sometimes they can be caustic. Uh, And the people who suffer, uh, you know, it's never the job. The last thing that suffers in law enforcement is the job. The job always gets done and we do it well. It's Mm -hmm. the blessings we are. The first thing that suffers as we're doing this job so well is the people who do the job. And secondarily, the people who suffer are the people who come alongside and support us as we do the job, primarily your family. Mm-hmm. And uh, what makes you a blessing in crisis, well, those same attributes might be the curse when the crisis is passed, when you're raising children or when you're involved with a significant other or when you're sitting in roll call. And, uh, you know, I started losing some good friends, both personally and professionally. And uh, one of my best friends committed suicide early in his career, and he was one of the most phenomenal law enforcement practitioners I've ever met. And Mm -hmm. He's a true blessing in my life. And he was officer of the year, and he's beloved by me and his family and his department. Very popular in the department and the community. The community respected him immensely, and uh, we lost him that fast to suicide. And that was a wake-up call for me, and I started studying this culture and how it can lead to a quick fall emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually, and how that fall could be catastrophic uh, to the person who has fallen. Mm -hmm. You know, we always talk about officer down, and we think of that as being tactical. Well, it's also emotional and spiritual as well. I would venture to say that that's that's very high on the list. It Um, is. You know, because it's one thing we were talking earlier about, like, you know, going to the gym and working out. If you do not tackle the emotional aspect, and you, you'll just be the strongest officer in a bad place. Ah, oh, I love that. Absolutely. You'll be the strongest officer in a bad place. In a bad place. That's, that's brilliant. That's exactly what happens. In, in other words, you, you can represent by being the blessing in crisis, mm-hmm. you can represent the curse of that if you don't understand where you're at. Yes, sir. And, and it requires a high level of self-reflection that we often know our least that we kind of lose those skills because we're, we're, we're trained for this. And tell me if I'm wrong. When you go to the academy, really what the whole academy experience is, who's at fault, who's to blame, and how to assess that very quickly. Mm-hmm. Who's at fault, who's to blame, who's at fault, who's to blame. And, and they put us in critically stressful, toxic environments, and very quickly we learn how to assess that toxicity very quickly and see who the problem is, who, who created the problem. And then we move in as tacticians, and we carve it out almost like uh, – Surgeons who can carve out the cancer and everything goes back to normal. Right. And really what that is is who's the fault, who's the blame, who's the fault, who's the blame. Well, now you've changed for all bunch of reasons I hope we get to talk about specifically. And those changes ultimately will come back to who's the fault, who's the blame. Well, now you're out of balance. You're a very strong officer in a bad place. I've, I've never heard it put that way, and it's absolutely brilliant. Well, that bad, uh, the, you're very strong at what you do, but you're at home. 
And yeah. that's the bad place to be exhibiting no skills. Absolutely. And so, yeah, we got to start putting some of this together and talking about it more honestly and more openly mm -hmm. and more regularly. Because otherwise, too many of us are living the curse of being the blessing on the hero's journey. <clears throat> yes, sir. No, for sure. And we were at, I was actually at a health assessment, um, another nonprofit. We got a grant for the, the SWAT team. We sent mm -hmm. them to do a health assessment. And uh, the lady was talking about the, the kind of the stress the hormones like cortisol and the, like the the high and the low and how our our stress receptors are are much more than the average person. They say Absolutely. any given time we have three times the amount. And sh and what she was saying is like like we thrive on that peak. Mm -hmm. That's where we love to be. And then when you get to a place of um, of rest and of safety, which would be supposed mm -hmm. to be home, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like you get down there and you start to to recover and your body starts to come down where it's supposed to be. Like you're, it's either time to go to work or it's like, man, I don't like this mm -hmm. <laughs> overtime, yeah. off duty job. Yes. Yeah. Hey, patrol needs help, you know, and yeah, then you're absolutely. right back at it at that peak again. And that's kind of where we, we stay, but you can like, you can't redline a car very long before the engine blows. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It, to me, it becomes the new normal. So normal used to be down here where it's, man, I'm at home. I'm relaxed. This is, and now after years and years of working, you're like, no, I need to, I need to hang out up here. You know, and so almost you, as if you become addicted to it. In other words, that stress, that hormonal injection, actually allows you to feel alive, uh, organized, and well in crisis. Mm -hmm. And the pro, and when you move out of the crisis environment, and that stuff starts to dissipate, like you were alluding to, we don't come down to a normal. We are known to crash and burn below normal and feel like we're delivering the crispy leftovers yep. to the people who care and count most in our life. So rather than feel like that, we get overcompensate by trying to get ourselves up there. And how do you do that? Well, war stories and hanging out with the guys and overtime or whatever. And, and next thing you know, you start drifting away from meaningful relationships just to try and catch that and so you can feel normal. <clears throat> because what the family's getting is us just comatose, like a bunch of blue zombies with no energy laying on a couch. And our families go, uh, what's going on? You're like, what do you mean what's going on? Well, we don't go out dancing anymore. We don't get babysitters anymore. You're just here and you got no energy anymore. Are you okay? I'm fine. Why are you asking? Do you got COVID or something? No. What's the problem? Um, quite frankly, you've changed. What are you talking about? I haven't changed. The whole world's changed. And now we got this misunderstanding at home. And now you might be very powerful, mm -hmm. but it's the wrong place. Mm -hmm. It's the wrong place. Yeah. And we're not very good. We're not very honest with ourselves because like, it's, it's cultural, right? Like it is if cultural. I bump into somebody in the hall, hey, man, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. Like that is literally, That's it. you say to every person, that guy could be like so close to suicide. And you what's he going to say? No, nah, I'm, I'm good. Like, it's just, and when someone says, man, I'm, I'm having a rough day. You're kind of like, what do we do? Well, with hold that? on. Time out. Yeah. You're, what supposed, do I do to, with you're supposed to say good. And yeah. then we're supposed to continue walking. And yeah. then it's like, oh man, now, now I'm, I'm like hooked. I got like, now I have this obligation mm -hmm. to like sit and talk. And, but it's like, you have to honor that moment Absolutely. of honesty that somebody has Absolutely. and it's, it's like we just keep doing that for 20 30 20 30 years years and then, yeah. then at the end of it like we retire or maybe you're forced out injury whatever it is mm -hmm. and then what statistically says you have 10 years yeah and then you're and then you're you're done I, I, it's, that, that's good yeah uh, i've seen it as low as 18 months 18 months is yeah. the number that really yeah, 18 yes. months yeah, you start falling that's, apart. That's crazy. You start falling apart. I, I hear I thought 10 years was like by 18 <laughs> yeah. months. Holy Yeah, God. you know, a lot All of right. cops are dying in their late 50s, early 60s. <clears throat> you know, everybody else is bumping to 80. Yeah. I mean, the whole nation is living forever, forever because of our health care services now, right? Pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. uh, cops, they're kind of leveling out in their... Late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. And there's a reason for that, and it's yeah. for all the reasons we've already discussed. Us. We're, mm -hmm. we're so adrenalized. We're so redlined all the time yeah. that by the time we're 60, if you don't know how to turn that off effectively when you're interacting with the people who care and count most in your life, in other words, your family, mm -hmm. <clears throat> then you do redline. And all it is is dopamine and cortisol, dopamine and cortisol, with no way to turn it off. And, well, now, by the time you're 62, you're actually about 115 biologically, and your cardi cardiovascular system shot, looking for a place to have a heart attack, and your, your whole uh, gastrointestinal system shot, looking for a place to launch a stage four, four cancer in retirement. Right. Yeah. And cops start dropping like flies early in retirement because they never figured out how to strike that critical balance along the way. And we're probably still abusing alcohol and, and mm -hmm. uh, caffeine at that point, even though sure. to, yeah. to try to, to, to uh, sure. facilitate that, that continue that ride. And sure. Yeah. It's uh, not healthy. Well, okay, Mr. Kent, let me ask you this. So I, I was a lateral, but when I went through the academy, it was you are always on duty. 
I was taught that from the day that oh, you, you know you sign, you are always on duty. What do you mean? I, I'm going home. I get off at five. Mm -hmm. You are always on duty. You're mm -hmm. on guard, and you you know. And I heard all mm -hmm. the stories. Hey, when I I'm cutting my grass and I have you know two guns on me at all time, mm -hmm. I'm like, holy crap! This is what I signed up for. Mm -hmm. So, how do we combat that now? Yeah, it's a great 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 question. How do you how do you strike a balance? Because we become fulcrums, right, for all societal chaos. Mm -hmm. And so let's think about that for a minute. We hired you. And then we sent you to the academy, and we jacked you up on the skills you needed tactically to survive the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. And we're going to send you to 100% of the 3% of reality, mm -hmm. day after day, week after week, year after year, for decades. Mm -hmm. And that 3% of reality is called trauma and crisis. And that's we're going to send you to all of it so everybody else can pay taxes and go to none of it and pretend it doesn't exist in our community. Hmm. Well, what does that do to the police when you're sending a small select group of men and women to 100% of rarefied air that is rooted in absolute utter travesty, trauma, and crisis? And you're sending them to all of it. Well, you better teach them the balance. Otherwise, they go into crisis and eventually they get stuck in that crisis hmm. mode. And now you're a cop 24-7. Hmm. You know, and we love to throw around this word, word integrity. If you're a police officer, you have to have integrity. And I go, okay, I get that. And if your definition of integrity is you have to do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons and damn the consequences to yourself personally, you have to be a self-sacrificing, self-suffering servant who's willing to do the right thing, I'm all in. But integrity is a confusing word because it actually comes out of the metal industry. And what they apply it to is like steel beams. Does that beam have integrity? In other words, is it always the same? Yeah. Is it the same throughout so that we don't have any weak spots? And that's important for metal. It can be a travesty for a cop. And when you're telling cops you have to be always the same, mm. that's confusing because we have to be a certain way in crisis. Mm. Drop the knife, do it now. Do you understand me? Holy cow, that was intense. Mm -hmm. Well, that can become... Brush your teeth. Do it now. Do you understand me? Now you got a three-year-old daughter going, uh, what the heck's going on here, Dad? We're talking about Crest, not crystal meth. Why are you talking to me like I'm a felony in progress? And now everybody's confused. Everybody's out of balance, and everybody begins to suffer. Because what we're going to always be cops, that's catastrophic. What I teach cops in all my seminars is, no, you have to be highly transitional, and you have to see the thresholds that you need to master before you allow yourself to cross over into the other side. Because if you're not doing that, if you're not giving yourself a professional pause to put a plan in place to ma master this threshold, then you're probably not snapping out of all the tactical skills you need to be the blessing that you are in crisis. And you're bringing those same tactical skills into your personal relationships. And well, now nobody wants to work for you because you're not a balanced boss. You make right. everybody feel like they're felonies. And now nobody wants to live with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, you know, I get testimonials all the time. Uh, you know, Chief, I think your seminar could have saved my third marriage, or the record seven. I think you could have saved my seventh marriage. Seven marriages. That's a cop who's always a cop. Going home, interacting with a, a bride as if, what, they're a perp? You yeah. can't do that. that, yeah. that that's called a, a destruction of meaningful relationships. And sadly, we can we kind of own this. We kind of train it, right? Yeah. Well, once a cop, always a cop. That can do damage. Yeah. That can do damage because, no, you're a daddy. Yeah. And you're a husband. And you're a son. And you're an uncle. And you're all the, you're a friend. And you know what? If I need a cop, I pay taxes. I'll call 911 too. You know, I can call 911 just like everybody else if I need a cop. I want my buddy. Right. I want my son. Yeah. I want my husband or my spouse or my significant other, whatever it is. And that's different than a cop. Well, let me, let me ask you this, though. Like, he said, you know, Katie said he started when he was 29. I was 28 when I became a mm -hmm. cop and transitioned. So both of us had like life experience up to that point. When you're talking about like 20, 21, 22 years yeah. old, like Absolutely. fresh out, either fresh out of college or oh. really fresh out of high school yeah. going into it, do you see that there's like those guys clamp onto that mindset faster or sooner than guys that are a little more established along the way? And well, granted, sure. I, granted, I had in the beginning, I did have an issue was coming out of the military. So sure. that was another That's a toxic. Whole Toxic environment well, as well. Well, it's another cultural indoctrination, right? Very much yeah, so. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, so, like, what you're saying with my kids, like, that was me very early on, especially when they're young and they're just mm -hmm. doing kid mm -hmm. things. And and o over the years, it's, it's softened as I've had self-reflection. But do you see that younger cops tend to grasp onto that as, like, an identity versus guys that come in a little later that may already be established or is of it just course. across the board? Yeah. Uh, the more limited your world experience, the less wisdom you have, the more likely you are to just accept what you're being told and fit in. Mm -hmm. Fit in almost like a, a puppet into a culture you don't understand. And now the, the cultural strings are all attached to you and you really don't know how to manipulate the strings because you have very little life experience as an adult. And okay, yeah, to a point, but 
you know, I learned this when I was an architect or I learned this when I owned my own business. And, you know, sometimes that doesn't play well with customers. Well, I didn't have any of that experience. You right. know, I didn't own my own business. I wasn't an architect. I was a cop <laughs> at a very, very young age. And I was all in. I wanted to be a cop since I was four. I read too many comic books when I was a kid. <laughs> you know, I wanted to be a superhero. And as I, started, yeah, as I started looking around, as I got an older, I was like, really, there's only a few uh, professions, right? There's soldiers, there's firefighters, and there's cops. And you know what? <clears throat> I want to be a cop. I want to be there at 2 o'clock in the morning. I want to face the bully. I want to help somebody out with their fears. I want to make the bump in the night go away. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was all in. I was all in. I was going to do whatever I had to to be all in and succeed. And I, it worked. I succeeded. Highly decorated. But the next thing you know, you're out of business. Uh, you're, you're, you're out of balance at home and with your command staff or with your peers. And the next thing you know, people start getting angry and resentful and socially withdrawn. And I call that the societal drift <clears throat> when you're when you're locked and loaded for crisis all the time, which is only really appropriate for 3% of your lifestyle. Everything else is public service, right? Right. And reestablishing people's dignity. But you're locked and loaded for crisis. Once a cop, cop always a cop. And that's the guy with two guns on uh, mm -hmm. mowing his lawn, right? Mm -hmm. Well, be careful. You might be a little out of balance with your neighbors. And maybe you're looking a little weird and you don't even know it because you're so in it, getting caught up, fitting into something you didn't know enough about. The next thing you know, it manipulated manipulated you to the point you might be a little bit out of balance that's all so. and you're more likely to insert yourself in situations that you shouldn't like uh, like there's definitely like like if you're sitting there mowing your lawn you got the two guns you're switched on and all that stuff and then then you know your neighbor comes out and you know they're doing something and something happens you're like you're more likely to be like well i'm gonna go i'm a cop i'm gonna insert myself like <laughs> maybe it's an argument they're having with his yeah. brother or whatever it's yeah. like and they're just like Talking intensely, like I'm gonna go insert myself. It's like no, like that's not that's even. not your place because where you're at home. Like, you're at home. like if you're driving by in a patrol car and you saw two people in a heated argument, sure, mm -hmm. that would be your place. That would be your, mm -hmm. within your bounds. But um, you're you know, more likely to find a way to insert yourself in those situations than, than you wouldn't. And be then like, and then you're with your family, and then things just happen. Like you're exposing like too much collateral just to like because your own inability to turn it off or or, or, or dampen it. Or your oh yeah, or your over your over identification with the role, yeah, because and an you're identity. always on, mm -hmm. right? Because you were told that it's like you got to find a hobby, you know, like you gotta, go fishing. Gotta, yeah. Your job is not your hobby, so you, like yeah. you can't, yeah. like you're yeah. not going to walk around as a neighborhood watch as a as a cop as a hobby. It's, 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 it's toxic. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. And yet, sadly, we don't talk about it like this. You know, cops don't sit around and talk about this. You know, right. what they do is <clears throat> they fit into a culture they don't understand, which gives them five unique perspectives. We all become pessimistic, non-trusting control freaks who fight change and assess blame, which is absolutely necessity when a guy's coming at you with a knife. Mm -hmm. You better be a pessimistic, non-trusting control freak who fights change and assess blame. <laughs> Drop the knife, do it now. But they didn't tell us those were our perspectives, and we didn't have them before we became the cops. They gave us those perspectives right. and didn't tell us. Right. And then they told you, you're always a cop. Well, then you go home, and now you're married to somebody who didn't know you when you were a pessimistic, non-trusting, control freak who fights change, excessive blame. But now they're going, what's this? And how do I navigate this? Because you can't name it, and I can't name it. And Mr. Rogers, the great Mr. Rogers, brilliant man, very wise man from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, said it well when he said this. If we can mention it, we can manage it. And it's brilliant. The problem is we don't even talk about it. And when we don't talk about it, then we're so in it and we don't talk about it. You don't even see it. Next thing you know, you're being hyper manipulated by perspectives you don't even know are out of place. And now you're a very strong man in a very bad place, right? And now you're in trouble and you don't even know how you got there. That's why I think it's important to talk about the cultural ramifications. And law enforcement, I have always said, is the most misunderstood culture on the planet Earth. There is no more misunderstood culture on the planet Earth than law enforcement. Everybody loves a cop when there's a crisis. Nobody knows what the heck they think about the police when there isn't the crisis. It brings up all this baggage and all this historical, out of context relationships. And next thing you know, it's like, it's hard. It's hard on this culture because we're so misunderstood. And <clears throat> and they don't, people don't know what we do when we're not. They like, really don't. Like, what do you do aside from like, when there's crisis? Like, yeah. there's like a whole lot of, like <laughs> the whole, whole wide range of services that we, we provide. And oh, then, most of it. Because you, like, you meet somebody, you're like, hey, I'm a cop. What's what's the number one thing? Oh, man, one time I got pulled over for speeding. It's like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I can't tell you the last time I pulled somebody mm -hmm. over for speeding. Like, I, <laughs> yeah. like uh, I, I'm not driving. Never. <laughs> I'm going to say, like, okay, cool. That's a that's a great story. I'm glad you had an, this interaction with a cop. Sorry you gave you a ticket, but I don't yeah. know. I'm a, but yeah. it's like, that's the only perception. That is. And it's just like, oh, it's 
you're enforcing stuff. It's like, no, there's there's a whole vast part of it. People don't understand it. So they just, whatever brief little teeny tiny little thing that they oh, understand, yeah. they're like, all right, let me stretch that out and yeah. go, oh, now that's yeah. what cops There's do. my connection. It's like, yeah. no. Like, they have no clue. No clue. 97% of what we do is uh, the reestablishment of people's dignity. That's really, think about it. That's what we do. They, people, you know, we oh, the police serve and protect. Yeah, kind of. We do our best. But most of what we're going to is people that have already been victims. Yeah. Uh, so we can't really serve them. They've lost their bike or they've already been punched in the, in the jaw. It's already happened. We have a victim here. So we're really not going to make it go away. We don't have a magic pixie dust to make these things go away. So really what they're calling the police for is that we show up and we care mm -hmm. to the point they know emotionally and physically and spiritually that they matter to right. something that's bigger than all of us, right. the community. Regardless of who they are. Because it's like, regardless of who like they are. Like you have somebody that yesterday, you know, yesterday's criminal, today's victim, right? So yeah. like it may be someone you've arrested, but today they're a victim of a crime and you show up and you already have this relationship. And this happens all the time. Like you, mm -hmm. you get those people that you mm -hmm. build relationships with. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, like, like, yes, a few days ago I arrested you for stealing a car. But today you're a victim of assault, so we're going to talk about that, and we're going to get into that. And and it's like even somebody at, the, at what would be considered the lower end of society, right, the, mm -hmm. the, the type of person that those people pay us to to deal with, right. it's like, no, I care. And then you're still giving them the dignity even though, like, last week we got into a high-speed pursuit with you and Absolutely. arrested you, right? So Absolutely. it's it's it is you have to, like, be able to switch. Now you, it's, you, it's, you, well, you, it's incredible how fast that transition takes place, too. It yeah. really is. You're absolutely right. Good cops. I mean, chase you over a fence yesterday and roll around in the mud and the blood and the beer and all that stuff and hook you up and take you to bond call. Uh, but it's over. Tomorrow's a new day. Mm -hmm. and, and, then we've all and we've all made mistakes. Some, some of us more than others. And yeah. some of us uh, needed to get arrested. So I have a cool down period and a whole bit. But that doesn't mean your, over, your overarching life trajectory is negativity. Not and right. I care. Right. And you count. And the next time I come in contact with you and I come at you with uh, two holsters full of dignity, People get, oh, my gosh, yeah, you do place. care. Yeah. Yes, I do care. I don't know why that's such a mystery. That's why we put the uniform on. We yeah. self-sacrifice. We drive fast to be put in pain in somebody else's behalf and to reestablish their dignity. Ultimately, that's my des best description of what law enforcement is. We drive fast to reestablish the dignity in the fray, understanding that, I'm sorry, your bike's already stolen. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I was 14-year-old and somebody told my bike, and I remember how I would want a police officer talking to me in this mm -hmm. moment. That is tragedy. Now, to a cop... We're not going to find the bike. We lose cops get bikes get boosted all day long, but this child yeah, they, don't they had their dignity mm -hmm. attacked. Their dignity's assaulted. It was his birthday present. That guy wanted that bike for his whole life, and he finally got it, and somebody boosted it out of the backyard. All we can hope to do at that point is show up and make the, sure that child's dignity is intact in front of his parents and before we leave, because that's really the role of the police is to reestablish dignity in an otherwise broken world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, let's talk about let's talk about what you do at Breach Point. Is uh -huh. that so, like here, obviously, Grand Prairie Police Department, we've like we've established a whole lot of systems in place yes, to, try to, to try to. That you should be very proud of. Well, we appreciate that, and then and we're we're continuing to try. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't just stop. It's always a a, a search for what's going to help with the health and and, and uh, both physically and, and mentally, mm -hmm. and then and ultimately our families as well. And so we've we've got so many systems in place. We've got cardiac screenings. We have like we're talking about gyms mm -hmm. um, for people to 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 use to like burn off some steam, get fit. Um, we've, we've, we had like the fit force, which was all a, mm -hmm. an evaluation. So why don't you talk about how we got linked up with you, the Absolutely. guy from Illinois across the country. <laughs> <and> like, <laughs> well, that's the, that's the mystery tour of my life, right? I didn't sign up wanting to build an international consulting firm. That just happened. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was more surprised than anybody. I'm just a broken, miserable mess trying to figure my own journey out. And along the way, I started helping a few of my peers to my left and right. And that caught on. Next thing I know, I'm a spokesperson in our, within our own department, and that got caught on. And next thing I know, I'm talking in our area, and that caught on. And somebody was sitting in the audience. I didn't even know they were there. And then next thing I know, I'm out in Colorado talking to the International Chiefs of Police, and my life changed. Yeah. And I didn't wake up wanting to do that. I just love cops. I got a bias. I love cops. Right. I, know, I don't think. I know what they do for a living, and I know how their family suffers in their support of the cop. Uh, you know, you can listen to the media all day long. It's just inaccurate. Uh, and I don't want to get into the few bad apples, of course. There are a few bad teachers out there. Right. And we arrest them and we put them in jail. And there's a few bad dentists out there or chiropractors. We arrest them and put them in jail. There's a few bad cops out there. You see, here's the, here's the problem. We don't, there is no perfect universe to recruit police from. We recruit from the same community, the, the same community and yeah. same human race. And humans are broken. And we have that. Uh, now, we work really hard at training ourselves out of that so that we're 
dignified in and amongst crisis. And for the overwhelming majority, we are. But then I lost my best friend. And he was as balanced as I could imagine. So I was shocked. And I was literally changed my life and my perspective of what's going on. And I started researching this culture. And I learned something. These five perspectives are a blessing in crisis. They're a curse when there isn't one. It's okay to be a pessimistic, non-trusting control freak who fights change and assesses blame. In crisis, mm -hmm. everywhere else, it's dysfunctional. And the five leads, leads to the four. At four years on the job, we become very self-sufficient. You guys are great cops, which means you are extremely emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually self-sufficient. You don't need anybody in a crisis. I mean, it's nice when the backup shows up, but if it happens, boom, and it blows up in your face, you're going to handle it to the best of your ability. Most people just fall down in the fetal position and give up. Mm -hmm. That's not what cops do. We go into it and alone in a squad car. And I want you to think about that. We ask cops to drive around morning, noon, and night, day after day, week after year, alone in a squad car. There are no more two-man squad cars in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Even the big cities have been defunded to the point they're all down to one car. So there is no immediate backup when it hits the fan. Boom. And when it blows up, it blows up that fast. And you better be self-sufficient or you're not going home. So every cop becomes very tactically self-sufficient. They know what they're going to do. They think about it. If I go around this corner and there's an armed robbery going on in the gas station, this is what I'm going to do. And they start playing these scenarios through their heads so that they're always on, always ready, always mm -hmm. redlining, right? Right. And that's a blessing. But that same level of self-sufficiency is called a divorce. Yeah. You can't go home self-sufficient. That just doesn't work in a marriage. You can't go home self-sufficient from your family. You can't walk around the hallways of headquarters here self-sufficient because that's called a toxic attitude. Mm -hmm. And cops do it. And they don't even know they're doing it by fitting in. And they become too self-sufficient. And they start putting out that toxicity that people pick up on. And next thing you know, your career's stagnant. You're getting passed over. You don't know why because you're so good tactically. And it shouldn't be this mystery tour, mystery tour that it can become to too many cops. So that's the five and the four, which leads to the three. Uh, we're all responsible for three social arenas simultaneously. <clears throat> Excuse me. I call it walking three dogs simultaneously. If you try to walk two big dogs at the same time, they'll twist themselves up and knock you on your butt. Yeah. It's hard to walk two dogs. Well, we walk three. The street, which makes us different. Mm -hmm. We sign up to walk that street, and that dog will rip your throat out. This dog will literally kill you. And yet most police say they don't find it stressful. I love the task force. I love SWAT. I love night shift. I love my guys. Uh, what they find stressful is the next dog, which is the department. Ask most cops where the stress yeah, comes from. Yeah. They're going to say it's the department. <laughs> it's the oh, department. Sure. Gangbangers, I know those guys by first name. i got to respect with them. The headquarters, oh, you got any Advil? All i got to do is think about it, and my blood pressure goes up. <clears throat> and that goes both ways. I teach at chief conferences. I ask chiefs, I go, chiefs, where, where does your stress come from? And they, every chief goes, well, my job would be easy without my staff. So you got the staff going, my stress comes from those guys, and you got those guys going, our stress comes from those guys, because really nobody knows truly where it's coming from. So that's the street and the department. <laughs> And then there's the third dog, which is your personal life. Mm -hmm. And we're known for having to camp out at a buddy's house for a couple nights until things cool down at home. Or maybe you got a real good buddy and he'll help you move your couch back into your mother's basement because things don't cool down. Yeah. But if you track a 25-year career of a typical cop, they're going to blame the department for most of their stress, followed by the personal life. We give the street a pass. Why? Because we love it. Because yeah. we love it and we, we train you. We train you how to walk that dog. Mm -hmm. And you listened. I mean, it truly is a drug. It, it, like, uh, like when, it's, a when good, you, it's a good analogy. When we're at home sometimes, and especially, dude, I could see it. Like you get the most intense week or intense day or whatever, and you're at the house, and it's kind of coming down. Like it's like suddenly you're starting to get a little irritable, mm -hmm. like you can't sleep. Perfect. And when you start looking at this kind of stuff, like this, those symptoms versus the symptoms when you ask like some some drug addict, like, hey, what does it feel like coming off a drug? Oh, oh my gosh, they're the same. Same like, thing. Like we are same we are thing. addicted to that. And and just like an addiction to methamphetamine or heroin mm -hmm. or, or or fentanyl or whatever it is, mm -hmm. that can destroy your life. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the this addiction to the street and that feeling it gives me all the time. Because even yeah. even when you're not doing anything, just driving around, like it's just you, like it you is. feel because you're like something's about to happen. It's that anticipation at all times that something's about to break off. Yeah. That's just like it makes you feel alive. That's, it. that's exactly it. Is. it it's the crucial anticipation of violent confrontation while you're alone with another person. That's a universal phobia. That's the only fear everybody has is violent interpersonal aggression mm -hmm. from one other person when you're by yourself. And yet that's what we do for a living. We drive around alone all night long mm -hmm. 
looking for dangerous people doing dangerous things in dangerous places and we're alone while we're on the mission seeking it out. And we know darn well we're going to bump into them from a time or two. <laughs> and we, we hope we do. We like, hope that's, we do. Like, that's, we like, I'm like, that's what I'm here. Like, that's wow, exactly I work right. out. Yeah, most people pay taxes and avoid that. No, we drive around scouring neighborhoods and scouring cities looking for that. That's a completely different human being who will do that. And they get really good with that dog called the street. Mm -hmm. And we train you how to walk that dog. And you paid attention and you got high accolades in the academy. And we call you Officer of the Year and we gave you a Valor Award. All the good things that this department's known for. It was all that valiant behavior. <clears throat> it's appropriate on the street. But in the department and in your personal life, it's a little excessive and it can throw you out of balance. And next thing you know, you got the five perspectives. Pessimistic, non-trusting, control freaks who fight, chain, assess, blame, walking around way too self-sufficient. And now you're at home or in your department. It's not working so well. It's not working. Well, so it's well. like my wife and kids. They don't care about my the accolades. They don't. They don't care about right. the letter accommodation I got the other day. They don't care. Like I'll I'll get come home and be like, babe, like got to this pursuit, and then this guy ran. I jumped over this fence. You should have seen me. I was so badass. All this other stuff. And she's like, oh, okay, that's no, that sounds nice. <laughs> and then she goes into like, well, hey, the kids have this thing at school, yeah, and, and then oh man, and this, my mother. And yeah, exactly. And you're, and you're like, you're, uh -huh. yeah, you're like, man, I was hoping like. <laughs> Like this would like uh, yeah, uh, yeah something like I was hoping maybe I, maybe I was hoping you'd thank me like be, yeah. be like real appreciative right yeah, or whatever right. but it's like they don't care about that stuff because they care about you and it's like yeah. it and with the, that addiction it's like man I want to go back to the place where people care about because it. it's like you, at the end of that pursuit what does everybody do like oh man dude that was oh, bad that, dude that was crazy yeah, that was like awesome. and everyone is like awesome. pumping you up and you're yeah, like absolutely. yeah you're that or they're giving you for like losing them or like yeah, right. hitting the curb and then popping your tire or whatever it is. But <laughs> but even even on that, like it's that's still the the excitement we're after. And then Absolutely. we just don't when we get addicted to it, we don't get that from our families. And that's right. that's the kind of the, the unfortunate well, part. And and then there there is a way that you can find that same fulfillment. It's just a matter of now you have to that. change the the perspective. Now you also have that. to like expand your horizon. Go there are more to life than chasing mm -hmm. bad guys, chasing meth heads like Amen. like I was doing Amen. you know thirty minutes ago right <laughs> you coming on this. It was like it, there is more to that, and then once you start diving into that, you realize, oh man, this is such a small aspect of the world. Absolutely. And when I'm off duty, I pay taxes too. I pay Amen. taxes so that way somebody else, when I'm not here, can go find the bad guys. And maybe so, I like, can coach third base or take her to her daughter daddy's dance mm -hmm. over at the church or have a date night scheduled weekly with my spouse, mm -hmm. right? Because if we don't organize our life like that, then the street starts taking more and more of your soul, your mind, and your heart, and the family starts feeling as if they're being cast adrift, almost, by the cop who becomes all in on the third dog. You got to be careful. There's a fine line there. There's a but, fine line. There. But I just want to touch on what you said about, like, the departments. They can teach the officers how to be, you know, just badass officers, be able to go out there, tactical, mm -hmm. handle your business. Mm -hmm. Kudos to the departments that have woke up and said, you know what, now we need to put that same energy into finances. And you do that. We do. Grand uh, Prairie does into, we do that. Uh -huh. And into, you do it well. Oh, yeah. Into family. Absolutely. And you do that. Mental health. You do that. You know, because one of the things that, that brought me on to, to Grand Prairie, I'll never forget, when Chief walked in and go, okay, uh, Katie, your family is just as important as this other officer's family who's been here 30 years. Where I came from, it was no year. <laughs> Your off days are Tuesday, Wednesday for about 17 years. Right. You have no voice. <laughs> there, yeah. You have no voice. And so we came over here, and it's like, nope, you're going to get a weekend off. Every other weekend you're off to enjoy your family just like this person. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, where have you been for years? Exactly. And police officers are starved for that level of empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's a special kind of leadership that collectively gets together like this they do here mm -hmm. and says, okay, we're going to start putting the pieces of this hero's journey together, mm -hmm. mind, heart, and soul. And to keep them in balance. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to the hero's journey. Can I mm -hmm. throw it out there yeah, real quick? Yeah, absolutely. The hero's journey, it's an ancient story that uh, is very uh, appropriate for t modern law enforcement. It starts in the land of ordinary, whatever that is for us. We all started in the land of ordinary. Now we have different versions of what ordinary is, is being brought up. But somewhere along that line, we got stagnant in our ordinariness. And we got a little bored. And we had a calling that says, hey, I feel like I've been put on this planet for more purpose than this. I'm kind of bored hanging out with my buddies here in this neighborhood. And I think I was cut out for more. And that's called the calling. <clears throat> and you get that calling in your soul that says, I want to participate in something that maybe requires some sacrifice for me so that I can serve something larger than myself. That's the calling. And the, if you answer the calling, and you did, you came here, you applied, and the next thing you know, tag, you're it, and they hired you. Well, now you cross a sacred line into a strange new world. 
that you know nothing about. And nobody knows what it's like to be a police officer unless you're a police officer. And we know what I'm saying when I'm saying that. I'm not right. saying that to say you can't yeah, you, think about it. Yeah, right, but, right. but it's a different world. It really is. And that's a strange new world. And on the other side, you're going to immediately be introduced to your mentors, your training, and your new partners. And that's going to put you on a path called the path of triumph and tribulation. The problem with this path is it also comes along with enemies and tragedy. And these enemies and tragedies have a way of nudging you down a rabbit hole that was always referred to as the abyss, where you feel lost and alone in something you don't understand. And nobody can possibly understand. You, you don't know where to reach out for help. And that's where tragedy can occur, both to relationships and your mental and spiritual state. Mm -hmm. So what you hope for is if you ever find yourself in that abyss stage, that you can have a secondary awakening because you've been trained with this as well. And when you feel like that, you're not lost. You're not alone. You're actually probably right on time. You're a human being who's suffered multiple traumas, and it's time just to take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Well, that can lead to an awakening, which leads to what they referred to as an atonement, which I refer to as the snapback that we can get from snapping this wristband, which is, okay, I get the whole hero's journey. And it's time to snap back to balance I know what that is and get myself back, back, back in balance in a strange new world, knowing I can never go back to the land of ordinary. Once you cross over, you do change. You change significantly. The question is, let's not change so much that the blessing becomes a curse. And right. let's keep ourselves in check and balance. That's the entire hero's journey. Uh, <clears throat> and I travel and work with police departments and individual officers and command staff to teach them. You don't want to lead a bunch of organizations stuck in the abyss. Everybody's going it alone together and everybody's in survival mode because nobody's talking about it openly and honestly like we are right here. And this is really normal in your culture. This is how you yeah. guys talk. This is how you talk in hallways. This is how your command staff talks. I watch how you interact with the uh, operations chiefs and uh, administrative commanders and the whole bit. And this is, this is not uh, abnormal for this department. It's part of your culture, which you need to take credit for because it's really unheard of. A lot of departments become <clears throat> kind of cloaked in this almost this universally shared anger of despair of what's going on. And nobody knows because they don't talk like this. Yeah. And these conversations are important. They just are. It's how you stay in balance. With, with like the mental unit, uh, the mental health unit that we have. And I tell Courtney all the time, thank God that her door is open. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I told her we're going to start a shirt that says go sit on the couch. Mm -hmm. Because I go in there and I'll sit down and I'll just start talking to her. You know, and you, you, I have a therapist, but I also go see Courtney, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like I told her, I said, used to when we were coming up, you know, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, it was shut up, go to the next call. You know, don't you cry. Don't worry about it. We on to the next call. On to the next call. Yeah, deal with it later. Yeah, you can't later. stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. I got no time for your sob stories, right? There that, you go. That's, yeah. And, and so I said, it's it starts to take a toll on you. And, it does. And it's, I mean, you're hitting the nail right on the head. It's yeah. like. My therapist, KD, well, you have to have time for your kids, your wife, your home life, because I got into that role of, okay, I'm off. Oh, I don't want to sit here. If I watch TV, I'm not doing nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm not making any mm -hmm. extra money. Mm -hmm. Do you need it? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. No, you don't. You just want to be there. And I found myself, I want to, want to be there, want to be there. So, um, yeah, it, it's Everything that we're saying is just like, it's like yeah. you're speaking to me. So Absolutely. To Absolutely. Well, the, the problem becomes, if it isn't a crisis— we don't feel normal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or yeah. we don't feel well. I, I feel well when I'm driving 80 miles an hour towards another storm <laughs> full of trauma. Well, it's got to be somebody else's crisis. Well, isn't that nice? And like here's not, not we, my own crisis. But here's, here's how we here, – and let me just piggyback that because it's brilliant. That's what we're good, good at. Who's at fault? Who's to blame? Who's at fault? Who's to blame? Who created this external crisis? And those skills are a blessing as long as it's an external crisis. What happens when it's the crisis equally likely is internal? And you go back to the same skills. Who's at fault? Who's to blame? Who's at fault? Who's to blame? Well, now you've got a bunch of cops walking around going, the morale in this police department's in the toilet. You can't trust the chief. You can't trust the lieutenant. It's us versus them. Let's all get angry collectively together and lash out. And we'll grieve them to their knees. And we'll bring this place to its... Uh, you let me know when that works for you. <laughs> no, what that is is a bunch of people hopped up in crisis mode, and they don't know how to turn it off. They have no off valve, and next thing you know, we start behaving as if everything's a crisis when it's not. Yeah. So if these these conversations are critically important throughout our careers, yeah. and, and sadly, too many organizations don't provide the the venue. I mean, we've uh, we've we've gotten to the point even here, like in the hallway and stuff like that. It's like, like. People are very open about going and seeing counseling. I've been I've been a counselor. Like the, the amount of people where it's like, hey, you should go see my counselor. Oh, you should, I did this mm -hmm. I did this type you know counseling or the, with this program and stuff like that. It's like, 
it's no longer something where it's almost like it's the same thing as a PT test or, or a yearly Amen. checkup. Like, hey, I gotta Amen. go, I gotta go talk to somebody for a little bit. But that is pioneering in this culture, and you guys need to take credit for that. There's very few organizations that have brought it to that level. Well, it's just what? No, that's actually very courageous, right? That what you just said, and you've said it too. For two very strong in the right place officers who are chosen to do the hard work on thyself to keep themselves in balance so that they can deliver the dignity they're expected to have and surplus to give to others. Well, you know what that's going to take? A lot of critical self-reflection. Uh, and sometimes you need a tour guide who's skilled in how to teach you how to look in the mirror and get to where it is you're trying to get. And when you got a whole organization who talks like that, the whole kingdom celebrates. Oh, my God, there they are, the humble, yeah. suffering servants who work hard at creating purpose in the pain and meaning in the suffering and hope in the fertility. And they look at them. They're all doing it together. Amen. That's all society can ask for. Well, speaking yeah. of tour guide, like, so you've been coming to us for like years. several years. years. And, 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 and yeah. probably most of the department at this point has been through your, yeah. your seminar they have here. And including me, I've, I've been through it as well. And, you know, myself and everybody I've talked to, like, there's not been one negative thing. And, and that's mm -hmm. a big thing when it comes to cops and training. Oh, we're pretty hard yeah, on like, each like, Yeah, we are. You go yeah. to, like, some training, someone's going to be like, ah, oh, man, I didn't like the way that they did this. Or yeah. I don't like, oh, yeah. like the way they talk. But I've heard okay. nothing. Like, every person that's ever been through your seminar is like, no, it's phenomenal. Because you just you have a way of putting in it the the span of an entire career in a way that we can understand mm -hmm. and, and and show us the where we're, where we're going to go if we don't do right, the right thing versus where we can be. So if – if if uh, someone was listening that was from a department or whatever, where could they where could they go to get in touch with you to to help this well, tour guide? Well, I appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you asking that. It's uh, Kent Williams at BreachPointConsulting.com. That goes right to my phone. You can go to the webpage uh, BreachPoint Consulting. Uh, there's a book that's now out that has all this information in it. It's available on Amazon or through my uh, webpage. Uh, it's called uh, BreachPoint: How Cops Find and Achieve a Balanced Life and Career. Uh, and really what it is is just a discussion on everything we've just talked about and then some. And we can go as deep as we want. Sadly, we're limited by time. I'd love to come back and talk to you again mm -hmm. uh, soon. For sure. So we can take it in a whole different direction. Uh, but there's a lot going on in law enforcement now that needs to be addressed. Because otherwise what you got is good cops who are true blessings and you want them on your department uh, because they'll save the day when things get really heated. But there's no off ramp. And so – we take these good cops and we throw them out of balance and then we send them home. And I just don't think that's fair to them or their families. In other words, there is a counterbalance to being a blessing in crisis. And let's make sure that we don't set them up to be the curse by always having to be the police. And we were told that. Mm -hmm. You're always a police. There is no off duty. Well, who suffers from that? It's not the job. The yeah. job's going to be great. Yeah. The family's going to suffer and the officer's going to suffer in a family that suffers. And that, at that I just don't think it's appropriate. I think, no, I want you to be highly transitional. I want you to be an absolute blessing in crisis by using all the tools that we taught you how to do. I just don't want you to be cursed when the crisis has passed. I want you to go home and be vulnerable and loving and optimistic and trusting and compassionate and empowering mm -hmm. of your children and your wife, which is absolutely the antithesis of what we do in crisis. Mm -hmm. So it requires this ability to transition and be very flexible. In other words, you got to be brilliant. Good news. Cops are brilliant. They just got to see it. And if no, and Mr. Rogers is right. If we would just mention it, we could manage it. I mean, even better, we could master it. But we got to talk about it. And here's why I'm so honored to be here. To be honest with you, I get asked to do podcasts all the time, and my answer is always no. Uh, I've developed, a, you know, you were a client of mine for years, and uh, the first time I met your command staff, I was blown away. I mean, very professional guys who were really bending over backwards trying to push this organization and law enforcement in general beyond your jurisdictions in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And they knew they couldn't do that without opening it up themselves and being vulnerable to staff. And I go, well, now you're talking about my journey. So let's get busy. And uh, we've formed a partnership, and I've been nothing but uh, blessed to be a part of you guys. And uh, quite frankly, I brag about you all over the country, and I should, uh, because of the things you're doing. I mean, you do spiritual health. Uh, you do emotional health, you do financial health, you do physical health, uh, you talk about the culture, you talk about the caustic ramifications of being good and on the street, but out of balance in the department and home. and all the, all the mentoring that should come along with being a well-balanced guardian on a hero's journey. And you guys do that very well. Kudos to your place. Well, we appreciate that. It's big coming from you with all the yeah. experience well, you have. Well, it's also very you. sincere. It's also very sincere. And I don't say that a lot, to be honest with you. Yeah. There's I, some good departments working really hard. But you're right there. You're right there on a spear point, man. You're, guys, you guys are transitioning our whole 
industry, and it, it needs to be done more. And th- kudos for the podcast. Why aren't yeah. we telling our own story? Why are we letting other people tell our story, and they don't know anything about our culture? So kudos for your courage to sit down and do this, and you do this very well, too. Yes, sir. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, I wanted to just throw it out there, though. Um, to the officers or the organizations, the different you know cities or PDs, when you see somebody in crisis, go and talk to them. Because like, like Joe was saying, you know, in passing, you could talk to somebody, hey, bro, what's going on? Oh, man, you know, we, I'm separated. And you can see that office is down. Mm-hmm. Take the time to go freaking sit down and talk to them for a few minutes. Amen. What I can't stand, and this is, I don't care about stars, stripes, and bars. If somebody is speaking to you and you get those buzzwords, but then they're in such a hurry that they turn, oh, okay, sorry to hear that, and yeah. they keep going. Isn't that something? Almost as if we're not prepared to do what, you know, all this training we get <clears throat> in critical uh, stress management when it comes to the community, mm-hmm. you know, how do you reach out to somebody who's talking to themselves on a street corner? How do you reach out to somebody who's living under a bridge? And how do you build the dignity into that relationship? And we get pretty darn good at that. And we mm-hmm. provide the training. But that's all external. And it should be. That's our primary responsibility, the community. Mm-hmm. But we can't take any of those skills and turn it around and think about how can we use some of these skills and apply it to each other? Right. Because I know you'll put your life on the line to go into that environment and talk to somebody who's maybe somebody with diagnosis, paranoid, schizophrenic, waving a, 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 bo- a baseball bat. And mm-hmm. you'll put your life on line to calm that situation and show this person the dignity they need to think about other ways we can get out of this and right. resolve this successfully. And yet, how you doing, brother? I'm not good. Okay, good luck with that. And you keep walking. <laughs> what was that? Right. Yeah. What was that? You'll do it for a stranger, but you won't do it for a brother in un- or sister yeah. in uniform? That has never made any sense to me. And I've been fighting that part of our culture for a long time. Almost as if we don't know what to do. And I've been trying to change that. No, we can save the day for each other, too. And that's a truly rewarding experience when you do that. Well, and uh, you guys have worked hard at it. No, I can tell you, you've worked hard at it. <laughs> Reading all those accolades, I'm like, oh, Jesus, where do we start? Um, no, we appreciate you. Um, this is definitely part one of a yeah. two-part oh, episode. Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah you got to well, come back. I promise we'll come back. Yeah, yeah I promise. You yeah. got to come back. <clears throat> and I will. Honored well, to be thank here. You, yeah, thank you so much for your time because we know you're you're a very busy man. Yeah, that's all mine. Thank you, brothers. Thanks for, thanks for being the example. Yes, sir. Appreciate okay, that. so until next time, we will uh, get back with y'all. Thank you all. God bless you guys.